people hold positions with great zeal and confidence that other people call conspiracy theories. So it's an important question to ask. How do we know that we know the things that we know? Welcome to The Conquering Truth. I'm Dan Horn. I'm Jonathan Sides. I'm Charles Churchill. And I'm Joshua Horn. In practice, everybody knows that that people know things, that each individual has things that they are absolutely certain of. For instance, you have a car and it's low on gas. Everybody says we know we either have to stop driving the car or we have to get more gas or it will stop running. And everybody just accepts that we know these things. And it seems so absolute. But what gives us that basis to have that level of confidence? And should we have that level of confidence? I mean, you're starting to ask questions about epistemology. I mean, that's going to be our topic for tonight. Epistemology is just the study of knowledge. It's what kinds of things can be known. How do you know them? What's your basis for your confidence in those things that you know? It's really a a connection between the world outside and yourself. And knowledge is really trying to give some kind of warrant or justification that you're perceptions of the world are accurate, that you're reasoning about the world the right way, that you are seeing the world the right way. And it's it's actually pretty complex to get from, oh yeah, I'm sure that that's true, to fleshing out what it means to have a good justification for believing something's true. Yeah, we did a previous episode on faith and reason, and we touched on some of these topics. We touched on the aspect of how that you know faith is necessary. Faith and reason go hand in hand, and it's one of the, one of the things we talked about there was that there are people who say you don't have to have faith, and they argue that you know they're empiricists. They're like you know you just go and you have to measure everything, you have to check everything. But the truth is, one of the things we talked about is no one can check everything, and if they do check everything, as soon as they've checked it, they have to go and check it again. If you've ever watched a man who doesn't do a whole lot of woodworking, or you've watched a man who or you've been that man who's doing woodworking, you measure a board and you walk away from it. And then 30 seconds later, you walk over and you measure the board again. And then you walk over and you measure the board again. And there's this part of it where you're always asking yourself, how do you know what you know? But in the end, we do, we, like you said, we do come down and we say we understand things and we know things. And that's a really, that's a worthwhile topic to talk about because it's easy just to gloss it over and go, of course we do. But What's your basis for it? And when we think about that, I mean, part of it is that there's this, we recognize our fallibility, which is why the somebody doing woodworking would measure three times because they question whether they really remember it correctly. And, and then there's actually just the idea of having that knowledge where we've, we, even as a society, we accept certain things that are true that, that aren't necessarily true. And we just believe they're true because... They're convenient because everybody else believes they're true. And so one of the things in Renewing Your Mind, we've been talking about that a lot, you know, taking every thought captive, renewing your mind. One of the ideas is that we have to start to say, well, do I really know these things? Or do I just think I know them without really having basis because that's what I've been told, that's what I've grown up with. And, you know, especially you look back at history. We did one a podcast on history. And a lot of the things that are in history, history is written by the victors. So it's not necessarily correct. It's the story that people wanted to bring forward. And that's why it takes real work to find the inconsistencies so that you can see where it's just a narrative rather than the truth. And so, I mean, I think one of the fundamental questions that you kind of come back to is from a Christian perspective, how can you know anything? I mean, and Christianity would say we can know things because of who Jesus Christ is. We can go to a verse like John 1, 9. That was the true light, which gives light to every man coming into the world. And there is a, so there's, there's some presupposition being made here. I mean, there's this part of it where God is telling us, but I mean, you're saying, we're saying one of the reasons why men can know things is because Jesus Christ is the light that is in the world. There is light that is in the world. Everything's not just random. Everything's not just happening, but there is knowledge that's being given to men. Men have, men have knowledge from God. And without that, there would be no way for them to gain knowledge in the first place. And it doesn't mean that they have to acknowledge that that knowledge is from God. They can just know that, that they can know truths that are real truths without understanding why that's a real truth that they know. 
Right. Yeah, and so, I mean, kind of along those lines, I mean, I'm, you know, there's this is a question that has interested people for a long time, uh, but I think there's probably a lot of people who are saying, you know, I know – I know things that are true. I know that when I put when my car runs out of gas, it dies. You know, why do I need to know why I know that? I I know that I know that. Why why does this matter to me at all? And I would just argue that, you know, Peter knew that if he stepped out of a boat, he would sink. And then Jesus Christ says, "Step out of the boat," and he doesn't sink. So those things that we think we know, we only know them because God has done things in an orderly way. And that what we're really doing is relying on the order of God, because God could override it at any time. And the other side to it is, there's a part of it where we look at it and we go, it's useful to know that if my car runs out of gas, and we say this is useful to know. But it's useful to know if you can know what happens when you die, if you can know what happens beyond these things, if you can know that there is a God, if you can know what it requires to have eternal life, if you can, if you can know those things, that's also very useful too. And so there's a part of it where people say they don't want to know these things. They say, or they say, I'm satisfied with just knowing, with knowing what I know that I'm pretty confident about. But the truth is, is knowing what you can know is actually very useful because there are things that matter a great deal. If this, if this life is all there is, if you eat and you die and you turn to dust and that's all there is and, and you dissipate and your consciousness fades, that's well and good. But why do you, why do you know that's true? And if there's more to life, wouldn't you want to know? I mean, we've been studying the book of Exodus and the way that that narrative is set up. God is saying over and over, I'm going to act in certain ways so that you know that I am the Lord. He says this to Moses. He says this to Pharaoh. He says this to the children of Israel. He's saying this thing that I'm about to do, this plague that's going to come upon you, it's going to happen so that you know that I am the Lord. And he's putting it, at, he's making it as a knowledge proposition you're going to see evidences in the world that are going to confirm facts about me. And given that, in many cases, life is literally on the line, like you said, it's a useful thing to know, but it's really the only way that you survive in the world. Right. And you see this later on in the plagues where Moses comes and he says, this thing's going to happen. And some of the people say, you know what, I'm going to get all of my animals and get them in the barn before the hailstorm comes. And other people say, ah, you know, who really knows? I mean, the Bible doesn't say that, but effectively that's how they act. We're not going to act as if God's actually the Lord, and they end up suffering greatly because of it. There are competing systems for how you live your life. You know, Christianity says you follow the Bible, you follow the teachings of God, and you'll get eternal life. And if you don't do that, you're bound for destruction. But then you have, you know, many competing philosophies to that, that say if you follow the Christian way of life, well, you're going to be miserable. Things are going to be horrible for you. And so you, even though you, you know, could you go about just, you know, not caring about these things? Well, you could, but you're, which, whichever way you choose, you're going on a path. You, you have to know why you're choosing that path. You ought to know why you're choosing that path because it does have real consequences no matter who you listen to. The one thing you know is it's going to have consequences. It's important too just because, we all have to recognize the, the pride of man, the arrogancy that we have in ourselves individually. And so because of that, we want to believe that we know things that we don't actually know. And that's really common. And it's, it's having the right epistemology actually gives humility because you start to say, well, I'm so confident of that, but I recognize that I don't have a scriptural basis for it. I recognize that, that I can't tie this back to something that comes from revealed truth by God so that I can say that's actually true. And we see people operate on partial knowledge all the time. We see people that state with great confidence that they know for certain that, that the COVID virus did not start in a lab in Wuhan. They said that absolute certainty, you know, you have to shut down anybody that lies about it. And now they're going, well, that may not be true. And so this arrogancy, the right epistemology, should work against our tendency towards arrogancy. You know, you look at, at the modern theory of how the world came to be, where it was all come to be by chaos, that there was nothing, and then out of that came order. Well, if you believe that, then you should not have an expectation of continued order. You should expect that order to break down. And so the person who's arguing that's how the world came into existence, the logical extension of that could be that it could all break apart tomorrow, so I can't assume anything about tomorrow just because of what happened yesterday. 
And so you start to get that knowledge actually breaks down when you start to look at the world in certain ways. And so it's, it's really intrinsic to even accepting that there is knowledge requires there to be some that, one that enforces knowledge, so to speak, that it can't all be chaos. So in a sense, the whole, the whole project of trying to come up with a structure for knowledge is really the, the attempt to get outside your own head. And what I mean by that is you, you, you have a whole bunch. I mean, this is like a freshman dorm room after hours. You know, it's way past your bedtime. and You're having one of those conversations with, with your roommate. This is that kind of question. But, but really, it's how do you know that there's anything out there besides you? How do you know that you're not just a brain in a vat that's having experiences? I mean, the, the real question is, is how do your perceptions actually map onto anything outside of you? And various different philosophical systems always have a starting answer to that question. That's where they all start. And really, Christianity does too. Christianity tells you, here's how you start. First thing you do to get out of your own head is you have to believe God. Proverbs 1, seven, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge, but fools despise wisdom and instruction. And really, I mean, a, a verse like this is, is foundational. I mean, philosophically foundational in the sense that you've got to start somewhere with knowledge. There's got to be a point at which you can say, this is where we're going to plant the flag. And from there, we're going to, we're going to build everything else off of that. And I mean, as we, we'll talk through some of the other options later on, but we're just going to go and tell you right here, this is what Christianity says. You have to start with God. You st- have to start with the fear of him. I do think one of the points that you made in that is that all systems have to come back to a point where you're saying this is what the basis is. In other words, all systems come back to faith. You just have to accept something because anything that says I'm the basis of knowledge, the way that you know it's the basis of knowledge is that it said it. There's no other way to do it. If you say that the reason your reason is you know, the basis of all knowledge, it's because you reason that was the case. And so you're really affirming your, they're all self-referential in the sense that they come back and always have to refer to the source of knowledge as the source of knowledge as to what the source of knowledge is. So a lot of people, when they complain about Christianity saying, well, God said it, so how do you, you know, argue that? And they come up with all kinds of other schemes, but in the end, all the schemes have the same problem. They all have to start that the, the source of knowledge is the one that has to say it's the source of knowledge. Otherwise, whatever says it is, is the actual source of knowledge. And it has to be outside of yourself. There's this part of it where you know yourself. You know yourself well enough to know that you can't be the source of knowledge. And if you know yourself well enough to know that you can't be the source of knowledge, you have to know that by something outside of yourself. You know, I mean, if your awareness of yourself is that I'm insufficient, it wasn't yourself that it wasn't yourself being the source of all knowledge that told you that yourself was insufficient. You know what I mean? And so there is this part of it where fundamentally you have to go outside of yourself. You know, I mean, you've seen yourself. You've seen the, you you know what I'm saying? I, I know what you're saying. I just think that, that there's a lot of thrashing in our culture because people say it's just because I haven't done it right, that I am the ultimate source of knowledge. But if you were, you would have never had to do it right. I mean, I mean that, you know what I mean? It's, I understand you, the you, issue. You, and so, I mean, and so I mean, if anybody who's even remotely attempting to be honest with themselves, they know they aren't the source of knowledge. There has to be something outside of themselves. And that's, so it is, it is just, it is self-evident as soon as you're self-aware you know, I mean, it's, I'm sorry, you're, you're born a little baby that needs everything. That's the source of all knowledge. You know what I mean? And so, I mean, everybody understands this, that they are not. And so when, I mean, there are people going home going, how do you immediately have to go outside for something? Really? Your argument is that you are self-sufficient when no one ever was. I, I remember somebody talking about, well, imagine the opposite. Imagine it's like you are the North Pole. You, you have a giant magnet strapped to your back, and you've got a compass, and you're trying to navigate the world. And you're like, look, look, I'm, it's always pointing north no matter where I go. And, and really, if that's the case, you don't actually know your way around anywhere. Everything's pointing back to you, and it doesn't help you to function in the world in any meaningful way. So, I mean, just to make it very clear, Scripture says this about itself. Like in Second Timothy three sixteen and seventeen, all Scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be complete, thoroughly equipped for every good work. 
I mean, if it's useful for these things, for correction, for reproof, to prove what is true is what reproof means. And for correction, that means that it's stating that because God said it, that it came from the breath of God, this is how we can know truth. And this is really the source of truth is Scripture. It's really important to point out as we do this, even though in one sense we're saying you go to Scripture, you, God speaks, and you recognize it as truth. There's another part of it where we say by faith you, you, you recognize things that are true and you understand them to be true. And God has made the world so that his truth can be seen and that his truth can be known. So, I mean, in, in Acts 17, 26 through 28, And he has made from one blood every nation of men to dwell on all the face of the earth, and has determined their pre-appointed times and the boundaries of their dwellings, so that they should seek the Lord in the hope that they might grope for him and find him, though he is not far from each one of us. For in him we live and move and have our being, as also some of your own poets have said, for we are also his offspring. And so, I mean, God's Paul here is putting this just really plainly and bluntly. God is... There is a sense where God is the thing in which we live and move and have our being. I mean, it's, it's a beautiful phrase, but it also explains the way we live our life. It also explains the way God has framed the world. And so even though there is, it requires a recognition of God, and like we said, there are men who go through their life living by the light of God without ever saying with their mouth, I recognize that God or even, exists. Or even believing, right? You're right. not saying that they right. even consider it. They right. could do it right. with complete they ignorance. They never, right, in their head, they never acknowledge who God is. Yet the light that they live by is God. And the way that they, the way that they live is by the light that God has shown them. And, you know, and remember, Paul is going and debating with philosophers here, right? I mean, that's what he's doing. And he doesn't go, well, let's just, you know, you give your argument for why you think knowledge is knowledge, and I'll give my argument for why I think knowledge is knowledge. He basically says, we're all in the same position. We're all in him. You know, we move and have our being. And so there's no one that can escape that system. There is a system of truth that is the world, that is the world because God is the creator of the world. And so anybody that's trying to argue a different system of truth, the reality is they're always borrowing from that system of truth because that's the system they're in, and they don't have the ability to override that system. They might pretend like they do. They might want to twist it so it sounds like they do. But in the end, that's where they are, and they have no other choice. There's only one choice, and that's to be in the world that God created because otherwise you have to be outside of God, and there is nothing beyond the infinite God. Like maybe you're convinced that you're just a brain in a jar that can imagine whatever it wants, but then you actually you can't do that. You can't make yourself fly by imagining it because you are in a real world that has real rules. And you also borrowed the concept of a jar, and you borrowed the right. I mean, you borrowed the concept of a brain, and you you're borrowing things from the real world because you can't escape it to come up with a philosophical system that's separate from the world. Right. When Elon Musk says that it's clear that the world is a simulation he's not doing anything more clever than the person who says I'm a brain in the jar. He's just, he's just pushing it up and, you know, one level up above him, but he hasn't solved any problems. He hasn't actually well, answered. one level below. I mean, right, I, I right. think I mean, it's almost a level below than right. the level above. But I mean, in the end, right, he hasn't solved any problems because he hasn't explained how he hasn't explained anything. He's just said, I don't want to think about it. You know, as, as we take a step back from this, it is important to remember Jesus Christ is the truth. He is truth, the embodiment of truth. There is nothing, no truth outside of him. And so it's really easy for us to think like the example that I used of the car, that if it's low on gas, you have to buy gas or it won't continue to move. Well, we can think of other things that it takes a man or a woman to come together in order to have a child. Well, God can overrule that whenever he wants. And that was one of the promises is that he was going to show that just because we think we know things, we don't actually know what we know. When you think of the virgin birth, right, Isaiah 7, 14, therefore the Lord himself will give you a sign. Behold, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son and shall call his name Emmanuel. That conception of a virgin, that is God saying that the reality is only knowledge only comes from me because I can overrule whatever I want, whenever I want. And ultimately, he goes, death isn't death, right? When Jesus Christ is resurrected, when he lays down his life and picks it up again, well, that's saying death isn't death. And these things that we're so sure that we know of, 
The reality is we don't know them. This is just how God normally operates. And so it's really God is the source of knowledge. And the virgin birth is a testimony to that, that God is the source of knowledge. And, you know, you you kind of come to the same thing when you look, you know, at science and you look at uh – and we start to go into like, you know, physics, you start to come across all these concepts, you know, dark matter, string theory, quantum mechanics, where you come to a point and you realize that the scientists, they don't understand how the world works, even in the most basic ways. They have these theories that explain some sets of the data, um, and, but, but it doesn't, they don't really understand how it works. They're just theorizing things based on the data that they see. And, you know, there you really start to see how little people understand about how the world works. And if you can't understand the smallest unit of matter, you know, how can you from your own wisdom understand a philosophy that you can, you know, guide civilization by? One of my favorite comic strips was, was an ep- a comic strip of XKCD called Fundamental Forces. And it's, this, sign, this person in front of a room saying, there are four fundamental forces in the universe. One is gravity. We have a formula that describes how it works. The next one is the strong force. It holds atoms together. The next one is the weak force. It And that guy goes something like mumble, mumble. And then he goes, and the fourth one is this, and it works in a sort of, and he, basically by the time you get to the fourth one, he can't even really use many words to describe what we even really know about it. At this point, there are just four things that they've given names to. One of them, they have a formula that sort of explains how it operates. The other three, they really don't know exactly how they work at all. And these are the things that they believe hold the universe together. And it's just, you know, it's just this great admission in the sense, at the same time, they'd turn around and go, well, hang on, we actually know a whole, whole lot. But they're really admitting in a sense, they don't. They just have ideas and theories that they've kind of put together. And all they really know is that God's a God of order, so they can measure these things and they can have an expectation it will work the same the next time. All they can really know is that as long as their memories actually work. But you look at these things and at least they're looking at at evidence that's measured and what they're basically coming back to is we don't know gravity but what gravity is but we do know it works in a certain way and so that you can measure it and it becomes repeatable unless you start to measure it too too carefully and then you find out that you're wrong because if it's up higher it's less and in the equations more complicated than that but ignoring all those things they're at least starting with data and saying we see this pattern but they reject the reason that gravity is gravity it's gravity because god said you know, two things will have an attraction that fits this formula. Right. They're like kids who grow up in a house with a father who wakes up every day at 7 a.m. And he does that for 20 years. Every day he gets up at 7 a.m. and he wakes them up. And the household, whole house wakes up at 7 a.m. And for 20 years it works this way. And then one day he says, we're going to sleep in until 8. And they all go, <gasps> and like the, the, like as if the rules of the universe has changed. But in the end... The reason 7 a.m. was because he chose 7 a.m. every day. And there's this part of it where people forget that the world is the Lord's. And God is consistent, like you're saying. But like with the virgin birth, like with anything else, any other, when God does a miracle, it's just God doing something different that day. It's just God disposing of the world in a way that differently than he normally does. But a lot of these theories, so those are the theories that at least you, know, you are measuring something that's measurable. And then there's a whole set of theories like the multiverse theory, which that is intentionally unmeasurable. The string theory, there's no evidence that ties to that. That's a, that is a philosophical theory that puts a mask on it being physics, just like the multiverse theory. These things are things that are just trying to deny that there is a God, and they have no practical implication in this universe at all. They're all just to say there is no God. So kind of changing gears, I mean, we've, we've given just a really basic outline of what a Christian approach is to the basics of knowledge. And, and it's worth saying, well, what are some of the alternatives? What are the, what are the sorts of things that the Christian position is pushing up against? And Colossians 2.8 is a pretty good place to start for, for the need for this, answering Joshua's question earlier. Why do we care about getting our standards of knowledge right? Colossians 2 verse 8. Beware lest anyone cheat you through philosophy and empty deceit, according to the tradition of men, according to the basic principles of the world, and not according to Christ. So this this verse is saying when you want to set up a foundation for something, here's your options. You could base it on human traditions. You could base it on human philosophies. You could base it on 
the natural world that you see, or you could base it on Christ. It's, you know, and those options pretty much sum up the range of ways that people are going to approach philosophy questions about knowledge. And, you know, everything we've been saying is, well, you really need to start with Christ. You really need to start with God. But there are other ways that people try and start, and the Bible's warning you against that. And a lot of them, what they try to start with is is reason, right? I think, therefore, I am, or I doubt, therefore, I am. And they start to say it is their reason that is their basis for saying that, that they exist, that they're real, that they can then make knowledge statements based on. And as you were saying before, I mean, it's a really flawed system of knowledge because I hope everybody is honest enough with themselves to say that at certain times they have reasoned and come to a conclusion that was flat out wrong. And so if knowledge and reason, or excuse me, if reason is your basis for knowledge, you have a real problem because your reason's not that good. And, you know, it's it's something, though, and I think this is, you know, part of the reason, the reason for the warning in the verses, it's something that can be tempting to the pride uh, of people, of all of us, to say, well, actually, you know, I, through my reason, have figured out that, you know, Christianity's wrong, you know, all these different people are wrong, and I am right. And, and, you know, even people who end up saying, you know, I'm an agnostic, we really don't know. We can't figure out these things. But I have figured out that I am smart enough to know that all of you are wrong and you actually don't know. And so even that, even if you're proclaiming your own ignorance, it still is exalting your, your reason and your pride. The idea of starting with reason, I mean, it's, it's not an accident that we have it this way in the, the outline because mm-hmm. realistically the— Discipline of you told epi- people we have an outline. <laughs> <laughs> it's epistemology as a as a discipline really starts to distinguish itself from other other modes of thought during the Enlightenment. I mean, you know, people always had theories of knowledge dating back to Plato, Aristotle before then. But as far as really digging in deep with it, it's something that's that people started talking about. Foster started talking about during the Enlightenment. And really, the first option on the table was reason. Well, actually, the first option on the table is just skepticism. And skepticism is, is one of those things that's self-defeating. If, if you want a, a technical definition of skepticism here, it's just the belief that knowledge is impossible. I don't think that's true. And, and the reason <laughs> that it's self-defeating is you just ask a skeptic, well, how do you know that? How do you know that you can't know anything and then you realize, oh, okay, that one just doesn't hold up? Um, but but if that's not the case, if skepticism isn't an option, then where am I going to get knowledge from? And the first player really was was reason. It, you know, you quoted Descartes, um, Rene Descartes, that that all of us know from our math books. He's the guy who came up with the Cartesian coordinate system. He's, oh, of course. <laughs> yeah, I know. But it's one of those. <laughs> yeah, I'm saying it. he was homeschooled. He may not know about it. <laughs> I've heard the name. <laughs> you know that XY thing that you have to do in your, your algebra books? Well, you can blame a philosopher for that. And you can also blame him for for this trying to come up with a system of knowledge that didn't start with God. He started with himself. And he's he didn't use brain in a vat, but basically he says, imagine that nothing exists except me. All right, that, and... and <laughs> I mean, it's kind of what he does. Him or me. But it's not, it's not <laughs> egotistic at all. It, and it, I mean, he has to start with himself mm-hmm. because he doesn't, he, he doesn't want to base his belief on anything. It's like, maybe God doesn't exist. Maybe my body isn't real. Maybe there's nothing outside me. All I know is that I have thoughts. And based on the fact that I have thoughts, I'm going to infer that I exist. And then from there, he slowly starts getting everything back that he doubted. And, and it's a system that's trying to start with reason, trying to start with himself, and ultimately it's not successful. And and part of that is the the next group of people who are also not successful, but they come up with some pretty good arguments against that. One of the things is if you go to scripture and what God says, there's a part of it where what Renee said is, what do I know? What do I know starting out? What can I know just by myself? And scripture says something different. In Romans 1, 18 and 19, it says, For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who suppress the truth and unrighteousness, because what may be known of God is manifest in them, for God has shown it to them. And God, so God says, 
Rene Descartes wrong. Starting out, men know that God exists, and men know that God's anger is against ungodliness and unrighteousness. So he's saying men know that there's such a thing as ungodliness. They know there's such a thing as unrighteousness. They know that God's anger is against them. And one of the things that's really important to this for me is it ties back to a verse we read at the beginning that says, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. There's this part of it where this verse is talking about that fear. This is a fear that even unsaved men can have. There are unsaved men who they look at the world and they say, there's a God in heaven. I am not righteous. I am not holy. And even if they turn in some ways to idolatry to hide themselves from God, there is still a part of their awareness of who God is that allows them to have knowledge and live in this world and survive. And it doesn't have to do with their doubt. It doesn't. In fact, what it has to do with is their certainty. And there's just, I mean, and, and it also ties back to Colossians when it says, don't let men spoil you. Because what happens is, is you can see that there's a God. And people come along and say, I'm going to tell you a story that makes you more central. Isn't that appealing? I'm going to tell you a story that lets you suppress the truth of God in your own unrighteousness. Isn't that useful? Doesn't that feel good? And they spoil you through vain philosophy. They cheat you from having a chance to have true knowledge of God because you suppress the truth of God in your unrighteousness. And I mean, and it ties to this idea that you know, Jesus Christ is the light that came into the world. So the problem isn't a problem with how do you find truth. The problem is we don't like the truth we find. Right. That's the major problem. And so fundamentally, the problem of knowledge is we're rejecting it rather than accepting it. And that's the biblical view of knowledge is that we're at war with knowledge because what it means is if we accepted knowledge, we would recognize all our sins. And let's be serious. Christians are at war with knowledge, too, because there's a certain part of our sins that we want to suppress. We're just not at the same level of war, and we're supposed to be putting to death that sin that's in our members so that we stop being at war with knowledge. Right. Because our sin is what makes us at war with knowledge, and the more we repent of our sin, the less we'll be at war with knowledge. But man, every man is basically at war with knowledge. And so the issue of truth isn't that the truth is hard to find, it's that we don't want it. Right. If you saw the world as it was, you would understand how very unimportant you are in that compared to God. And how much you deserve the wrath of God. Right. And, that, and, and again, that does not appeal. That does not appeal to us as, as sinners. And so when we think of reason as the source of knowledge, what we know from Scripture is that reason, what we're doing with our reason is trying to suppress truth. We're not trying to understand it. We're not trying to gain truth. And this doesn't mean that for pragmatic reasons that we don't gain truth in certain areas. But we need to recognize that our minds in the fall, our minds are perverted, they're twisted, they're darkened. And so because of that, it makes it a really bad source of knowledge because we're, it's working against knowledge, not working for knowledge. One of the easiest ways to see the way you act towards truth is to watch children. I mean, when you tell children something, I mean, if you watch how convoluted you tell them something and what they can take from the simple thing you tell them to what they can turn it into, to what they can hear. I mean, if you watch children, and, and, and understand, they are no different than you. You are exactly like them. They are you. It's just you have the advantage of being able to stand in a position and look at them and sort of see yourself in an objective way. This is how we work. I mean, and it is, and, but that is the picture of it, is the parent who loves the child, who cares for the child, who knows the child, who wants good things for the child, and tries to help the child, and the child rejecting, pushing away, you know, I mean, just, and twisting what the parent says, turning what the parent says, that's the picture of a person's response toward truth with God. It's one of those things, if you go and you, you read any of these Enlightenment philosophers, if you read people like Descartes or Leibniz or something, which I don't recommend, not really, you know, um, but they they don't really have a place for sin in their philosophies. It just, it's not ever part of the equation. Even, I mean, Descartes tries to come up with reasons for, well, why do I make errors? But he never talks about sin. He never talks about moral failings. He never entertains the idea that his reason might actually be flawed and impaired. Because if he did, then the whole system falls apart. And the whole point of his project is to try and build a system that is independent of God. I mean, he says so right in chapter 1. And I think that when we look, right, I mean, 
those are the philosophers that were doing that. But now it's pretty common that, I mean, you have lots of people going out there and just asserting things and they're saying that they're true. And they're, they're doing it based on saying, my reasoning got me here and so I can trust it. And one thing that Christians have to do is be willing to go, you can't trust your reasoning. You make mistakes all the time. Why would you trust your reasoning? You're not, you're not somebody who's trustworthy. And everybody knows that they've made reasoning errors. Everybody knows that they make flaws. So they have to know that that's not a good source for knowledge. That's not a good source for ultimate truth. We did an episode on emotion versus reason, and we talked about how one of the things is is when you respond out of pure emotion, frequently in your mind you don't think of yourself as responding out of emotion. You think of yourself as continuing to reason. And so when you're angry or when you're, you know, you're, you're being completely logical in your own mind. Every single thing that you do to make yourself angrier and angrier causes you to do these things, they make perfect sense. Of course I had to go over to his house at 2 a.m. and knock on his door. And when he didn't answer, I had to go in through his window. And that's why I killed him because he, you know what I mean? And there's this whole, you hear the person and they give their convoluted sense. But along the way, it made perfect sense to them. And, they, and yes, maybe later they can look back and say they weren't making sense. But at the time, they were reasoning. And there's this part of it where if, you, if you're not honest with yourself about, like this, about what you are, about what a man is, you can read Paul where he talks about, I see within myself this law working within myself to cause me to sin. And Paul's, Paul's, just, Paul's in a position where because he's acknowledged the truth of God, he can see himself in a way so that he can actually think about those forces. Because it's not just... Descartes likes to didn't talk about flaws in reasoning, but sin is more than just flaws. It's something that actually desires. It's actually a desire working, working towards a specific end. It's an act of rebellion against God, and Jesus Christ is the truth, which means it's an act of rebellion against truth. Towards death. Yes, and its, it's ultimate outcome is death. Right. But when you look at that and you think about that, you know, you gave the example before of a child that you look at them and you see how convoluted their reason is, reasoning is and how silly it is, how, how foolish it is. But we just need to recognize what, what happens as you grow up is your reasoning just gets refined because people challenge it. But your heart, unless it's been changed by Jesus Christ and you have a heart of flesh, the heart of every man is like that heart of that child that will make up the story that everybody goes, that's ridiculous. They just get better at it by the time they're 20. They're just a lot more refined at coming up with a way to suppress the truth. The child is suppressing the truth and you look at it and you go, no, that, you know, the fact that that your hand has blood on it from punching your brother in the nose. Well, yeah, that you can make up all the stories you want, but that's clearly not true. Just when they get older, they get better at it. Right. We, learn we to all wash get our better hands at it before we lie about right. punching our brother. Right. And so, but the idea is, you know, you see that very, very uh, simplistic suppressing of the truth. And we just need to recognize it's just a picture of how we suppress the truth and how, how adults suppress it. They just do it in a way that's less easy to get caught. Right. So, I mean, during the Enlightenment, you, you have this group of people who would call themselves rationalists. They say the primary way that you get knowledge is by reason. And the school of thought that developed against that, that was really reacting to them, would be what we would call the empiricists. And they believe that the primary way that you get knowledge is uh, through your senses or by your perception. In, and what's interesting about some of them, this would be people like John Locke or David Hume, is w- with, with many of them, they all often get to the point where they admit, you know, knowledge may not be possible. If, if, if all we have, if the primary But they don't way, stop writing. No, they don't <laughs> stop writing. Or selling the books. Selling <laughs> books. Yeah, exactly. Um, but but you know, the, the, the thing that happens here is, well, if we can't base it on reason, because that's got flaws, and the only way that we really have interactions with the world is what, by our perceptions of it, then at the end of the day, I, I'm back to making my source, my, um, I'm back to baking, baking myself. <laughs> Yeah, I really nice. am. <laughs> At the end of the day, I'm back to making myself the source that I have to base everything else off of. And it becomes really difficult to have any confidence in the world outside. I and mean, when you even make a statement like knowledge may be impossible, I mean, you're playing around with suppressing the truth and unrighteousness. Absolutely. I mean, you're, you know what I mean? And anybody, and there's this part of where people say things like that and people go, oh, that's clever. Because 
we're always looking for someone else who's suppressing the truth and unrighteousness better than us because we can borrow from their ideas. Oh, that's good. You suppress the truth really well. You know what I mean? And that's and it's it's and nobody admits that. They just go, we don't want to trust ourselves because our arguments seem stupid. But this guy, he can make a really clever argument that sounds good, so we'll we'll trust his argument. Right. And we'll say, you Oh, that's really good. Argument is that you can't trust my argument. <laughs> right. Right. I mean that's that is I mean and <laughs> Yes, exactly. That's how bad man is. <laughs> I mean, and it's probably, it's probably worth reading Romans 1, 20 to 21 here. I mean, because this is the last part of that verse is exactly what we're talking about. For since the creation of the world, his invisible attributes are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made, even his eternal power and Godhead, so that they are without excuse. Because although they knew God, they did not glorify him as God, nor were thankful, but became futile in their thoughts and their foolish hearts were darkened. And so, yeah, that is what happens. Is There's this point where you, someone makes a more and more foolish statement and people go, oh, that's super clever. That's even more clever. But it doesn't make any sense. That's why it's so clever. That just means you're not smart enough to understand it. And then, you're, yeah, you're wearing the emperor's new clothes all over again. And, you're, yeah, you're making them. You're wearing them. You're just you're, you're conspiring with others. To try to find ways to suppress the truth of right in righteousness, unrighteousness. And God in this verses, these verses too, is also saying, "Look, there, these things are knowable. If you could, with your perception, look at the world, you would know the attributes of God. You would know who God was. You would know certain characteristics. You wouldn't have a fullness of the knowledge of God. You wouldn't have special, what's called special revelation. But in general revelation, you would have enough to know there's a God that you need to flee to from his wrath because his wrath is upon you. There is a God that you should be thankful to for all things, that this is the God who is that if you actually would perceive the world as it is, you would know that. But the problem is you can't trust what you perceive because your perception will twist it so it doesn't. you don't see what's actually there. You see it in a way that even though the whole purpose of it was to testify who God was, you'll see something else and you'll say, well, this proves there is no God, right? People look at the universe instead of saying, look, for all these planets, for all these things to be out there, there must be a God. Instead, they go, look, that means it must be chaotic. It must be by random chance that everything's come about. They look at it and they see the opposite. It's not because of the testimony that God put in place was wrong. It was their perception of it. It was their sin that caused them to look at it and not see what was there. Right. Yeah, it's, it's like a, imagine a child who grows up in a household with a mother and a father who, who love each other. Not perfect, but they grow up in a household and they see marriage. They see a marriage and they see it acted out in front of them for, you know, 15, 20 years. And then they grow up and then someone tells them other things about love. And they believe these other things about love and they go and they make horrible decisions and they destroy themselves. The things that their parents did were manifest to them. They were shown to them. They were seen in front of them. They could see them. They maybe couldn't understand them completely, but they were there and they could have seen them. But what was sold to them was a lie that they wanted. And you can see people do this all the time. And God is saying, do you understand the world is like that? The world is like that. I've made myself manifest to the world and you could see me, but you don't want me. You don't want the truth, and so you believe lies, and you continue to make greater and greater lies. Right. So when you start with uh, your epistemological basis to be your own perception, you've already built in the flaw, and the flaw is you're trusting that the way that you see things is seeing them accurately, and the Bible says that's not true. That's just wrong. I mean, it's pretty— uh I mean, you know, elegant in the way that when you when you take the truth of God's word, you can have these these concepts that philosophers debate and don't have an explanation for, you know, right and wrong, good and evil, is there reality, all these different things we've been discussing. You know, yet these are things that everyone, virtually everyone agrees that these are th- real things. You know, you ask the normal person, is reality reality? Is there right and wrong? The answer is yes. But people can't explain that. And so Christianity can say, yes, these things are real. And here's why people believe those things are real. Because God gave them reason. Um, He revealed himself through creation. And yet there's sin. And there's an explanation for sin. Here's why people uh, are unwilling to accept the explanation that it's because of the God in heaven, because of that rebellion, because of the fall. And so you have this, this explanation as here's the the basis, the answer as to why these things are real and why people don't accept that. 
there's a whole set of things that can show you that your senses don't work the way you think they do. Everything from optical illusions to there's a sound experiment you can do where there's a person talking and if you look at there's a sound being played and the person's moving their mouth and if they move their mouth and you watch them move their mouth you will hear one word. If you close your eyes you will hear a different word because your brain is not your ears and your brain is not your eyes. Your brain is taking data from a lot of different things and it's putting it together. And it can be fooled, it can be tricked, it can, it can be, you know, there's, there are colors and all sorts of things that can play these tricks on your eyes. And so there's this idea, if, if you think, the think you know what your perceptions are, you don't know what they are as much as you think you do. And I mean, so it's, and it's, and it's very easy to see that and to be, you know, it's very easy to tear that one down. If that's your basis for everything, you're in a lot of trouble. And it's not just, you know, these magic tricks type things, optical right. illusions, you know, you, it comes down to matters of life and death. You know, there's been plenty of cases you can find where, you know, someone swore and truly believed it, that this was the person who committed this crime. Yes. And they get convicted of the crime and they're in prison. Sometimes they're even executed. And then later technology advances. They do DNA testing and find out this was not the person. Right. No, but the eyewitness, they really believed it. Yes. But, you know, their reason, their perception, their memory was fallen and whether it was power of suggestion or, you know, what, whatever it might have been. I mean, there's, you know, you, we're not going to get into all the explanations for that. But, but that, that memory that they were so confident in, that perception they were so confident in, was wrong. Yeah, you mentioned memory. I mean, memory is a whole other, I mean, ocean of unreliability. But we edit our memories. We, I mean, it's, it's a fun game to play is anytime there's something like, uh, you know, a political year – Ask people at the beginning of the year what do they think is going to happen and make notes. And then afterwards, ask them, do you remember we had, you know, what did you, what were you thinking was going to happen? And, and just comp- write down your own and don't go back and look at it. I mean, the things that you think you thought, you will change them because of thoughts you've had since then. Because you're embarrassed to have held a previous position, you will, rem- you will remember not holding that position. Nowhere near as strongly as you did. Sometimes the opposite of what you thought you held. Right, and subconsciously. I mean, this is not you know, right. always an intentional thing. This is, right. this is how the fallen mind works. And I mean, I, I've been in plenty of debates or arguments with people where they actually change their position in the middle. And they end up arguing. I have to get personal. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, did you say my name? Or no, just, I didn't. Is my face red? I, I but, feel hot. God made man out of dust. That's what man is. And man we blow is, around pretty easily. We do. And we're clay. And we're, we're, I mean, we just, we glorify ourselves, which is, which is what it says. I mean, we, didn't want to, we don't want to glorify God as God. And so we try to glorify ourselves, even though we're just clay breathed on by God. And, you know, in James it says that, we're like a wave that's tossed by the sea, right? The double-minded man, the one who doesn't know who God is. We should expect their positions to, all, to change all the time. That is the normal thing that man does. So the idea that he can go, no, this is what I always held. Really? What's the basis for that? Man gets tossed to and fro. We get, you know, we're, we're really bad at saying, I know what I knew. 9-11, when that happens. Some psychologists said, what can we do? Most of our stuff has been shut down anyway. So they said, well, let's get together and do a study. And we'll basically sit out on the street in New York City and ask people and record where they are and their contact information, then go back after a year, you know, after, I think they did it after three months, and then they did it after a year, and then they did it after three years. To see these things that were so vivid, right, that there's an idea of called flashball memory, which means that when there's a, an event that's so shocking that your memory takes a picture of it and that you'll remember it forever. So that people later can say, where were you when 9-11 happened? And that they can recite back and say, here's where I was. And they wanted to see how accurate that that theory of memory was and over time even over time to see how because of its flashball the idea is that you have this picture in your mind that remains and stays there and that's a common view of memory and they were trying to check if that was true or not so they had an event that the whole country saw that everybody it was a unifying event and you know there's certain details about it that everybody remembered you know even 10 years later because they got reinforced what did George Bush do at 9-11. These things people remembered. I was with Brian Williams. 
<laughs> getting shot at in a war zone? I don't even know. You ask him, but I was with Brian Williams. <laughs> so they had a survey that they asked a series of questions. They find out certain things like people's emotions. They don't remember those hardly at all. Like 50% of the people were completely wrong as to what their reaction was. But the one that they remembered the best was where they were when they saw it. So he's so the one of the authors of the study is is answering questions. He's doing an interview with with Scientific American, and and he responds to the question. We then went back to the 9/11 survey data, and we did see that memory was better for wear than the other details. So they were expecting that that people don't remember emotions very well, but they remember location better. In recalling where they were, they when they learned of the attack, people were 89% accurate at survey two, which was the one that was a year later, and 83% accurate at survey three, which was the one three years later. So after three years, almost one in five people couldn't remember where they actually were at 9-11, which they considered to be a major event, that they go, oh yeah, I remember where I was, and almost a fifth of the people didn't remember. Wow. Correctly. Is that correctly? The, so that so they said I remember where I was. Oh, absolutely. But yes. it was the wrong place. <laughs> yes. They yes. hadn't forgotten. Thank you. Quote unquote. They, they were, didn't think they had forgotten. They believed their memory was accurate, but it did not match what they said within five days or something like that of nine eleven. I think they started the survey on nine eighteen. And so they did it for like a week. So it was all within a two week period that they got gathered the locations for everybody and emotions and all these other things, but specifically the strongest one, the most accurate one, was where were you? And that almost a fifth of the people didn't get it right. I mean, one of the things that you can see, just we've we've talked about it, uh, only a handful of the the options for non-Christian epistemological systems. We've talked about rationalism. We've talked about uh, the uh, empiricism, and. And those two kind of hung on for a couple centuries, and it was more or less you were picking between one of those if you weren't a Christian, if you weren't a Reformed Christian. And then in late 1900s, early 20th century, you had—sorry, wow, that's wrong. In the late 1800s and then early 1900s, you had a particular form of, of epistemology develop in America called pragmatism. And it was an actual philosophical system. And one of the things that was really different about this, and one of the reasons it's worth mentioning, is because it illustrates the the devolution of ideas the farther away you get from God, the more you're trying to rebel. Because the one thing that the rationalists and the empiricists had that agrees with Christianity is they still believe that there was such a thing as truth and that it was worth trying to get to. And they just had a hard time actually getting there. With pragmatism, realizing that those projects were really difficult, they said, let's come up with something else. We're going to redefine truth. And instead of trying to say that we're going to, truth is a subjective thing out there, we're going to say truth is whatever works. Now, I know there's nuances and so forth, but basically it comes down to whatever works. And, uh, and the, the pragmatists insist, oh, this isn't relativism, but yeah, it is relativism, and it quickly becomes relativism. Mm-hmm. And that's what gets us to where we are right now, where you have people saying just completely absurd things like, oh, well, that's your reality, or this is my truth. And it's all, and, and there's no concept whatsoever of there being, needing to be something bigger, outside, corporate, objective. It really becomes just personal. That dog is my baby. I don't know if I'm a woman. Right. And, and that's how you get into a crazy world like this is you start with, let's reject God. Let's try and come up with systems. And, oh, those systems break down. And eventually you just keep building systems that are worse than the one before until you get to something that's just completely incoherent. And, and again, with all these systems, you know, as you break down to, you know, it's my truth and it's your truth. Obviously, those truths, though, they hit into each other. You can't avoid that conflict that proves that it's a flawed system. I mean, it, there is a truth that's beyond just what's real for you because it can be what's real for me as you can't shoot me and the guy pulls the trigger on the gun. And guess what? You found out that wasn't what's real for you. And there's reality hits the point where, where these systems, as you said, they just get worse and worse. But because we have to interact 
and because there is something outside each other, that becomes the constraint that the system breaks down against because it just can't go beyond the point where it can't explain the fact that your truth and my truth, if they don't, if they don't agree in the end, one will collapse against the other, they'll both collapse. Right. In the debate, the, the great debate between uh, Greg Bonson and Gordon Stein, there was a moment where Stein was kind of flummoxed by the idea that, you know, Bonson was asking, what is your fundamental basis for arguing that there's logic? You're, you're a materialist and show me an atom of logic. So you have to give up that logic exists. And Stein says, well, logic's just a mental construct. It's just something we've all agreed to. We've just all agreed to it. And Bonson says, if that was true, then we could just both agree that we both won the debate tonight. We could leave. And he goes, but that wouldn't satisfy either one of us, and it wouldn't satisfy any of the people who came out tonight to hear us speak. We know there's such a thing as truth. We can't just say whatever we want to is true. That doesn't work. We know we're lying. And it, it is. It was just, I mean, it's such a great moment in that debate, but that debate happens all the time between people. Let's just agree to disagree. Let's just agree that we're both right. Let's just agree that, and we'll go, okay, and it's pragmatism. Well, I guess if it works, it doesn't matter, but at a certain point, it does matter. At a certain point, things become laws. At a certain point, one a person can say they're a woman, and you can't say they're not anymore. You know, you said, let's just agree to disagree. And as with what we've said on this podcast many times, is that the world, the church is the light of the world. It's the pillar and ground of truth. And we need to recognize how dangerous it is when churches start to say, let's just agree to disagree. Yes, you believe God's sovereign election. I believe that I have the right to come to God however I want to, and God has to accept me. Well, let's just all get together and just agree to disagree. Well, that creates the roots of these things because God has described himself as a certain way. He says, you know, I show compassion to who I show compassion. I show mercy to who I show mercy. And these are things that if we just accept, let's agree to disagree, you can see how this works itself out in the culture, and it works itself out in the culture in a really destructive way. Right. When the, when the people who God says are his nation of priests don't know who he is, there's a problem. When they say they're Christians, right, right. little Christ, but yet they have no interest in truth, that's a real problem because Jesus Christ is the way, the truth, and the life. He is the truth, and that really matters, and that means that— that, you know, and I think it's Second John that it talks about, you know, your children walking the way of truth. That's, that's Christianity is about truth. And if you reject truth and say truth doesn't matter and let's all just, that's what you think and that's what I think, but who cares? It really is a rejection of Christ. I mean, what you're talking about is, is laid out really clearly in Ephesians 4, 20 through 24. But you have not so learned Christ, if indeed you have heard him and have been taught by him, as the truth is in Jesus, that you put off concerning your former conduct, the old man which grows corrupt according to the deceitful lust, and be renewed in the spirit of your mind, and that you put on the new man which was created according to God in true righteousness and holiness. And so when we think about, you know, we've been talking about epistemology, and it's this, you know, we can make this sound really philosophical. But it's also incredibly practical because part of salvation is that you accept that God is truth, that he is the one that owns truth, that, that when you put on the new man, what you're saying is Jesus Christ is Lord of all, that he's in control of all things, that truth is what he makes it. And, and it's really easy when you're evangelizing somebody and you're, you're going out and witnessing to them to forget that they fundamentally have to change how they believe what they believe because they have to believe that Jesus Christ is Lord. And that fundamentally is about truth, and it is about the worldview that you have. And it comes down to it. It is about epistemology. You have to put off that old man that says, I can determine my own truth. I can determine it this way or this way, and instead say, I need to look to God for truth. And so, I mean, it even manifests itself like when, when Paul says in Romans 10.9, that if you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, you will be saved. You know, one of the examples that I used before was that what we think is true, that we're so sure that it's true, like death is the end, it's death, Right. that the resurrection goes, that's not truth. I'm truth. I can lay down my life and I can pick it up again. And you have to accept that in order to be saved. 
You have to accept that God is the one that creates truth. And so when we, when we look at epistemology and we go, well, it doesn't really matter. Well, it matters because it, is, it has to tie to evangelism. It has to tie to what we're saying to people because if all we're saying is he's your savior without saying he's the creator, without saying that all things, that he's the Lord of all, that he controls all things. If you're not saying these things, their worldview doesn't change and they're still looking to themselves as the source of all knowledge. If they're looking to themselves as the source of all knowledge, that's not salvation. Salvation is looking to Christ. I I mean, absolutely. And, And salvation looking to Christ is an epistemological exercise because we've been talking about epistemology and truth and, you know, It's easy to think of these things as just these big philosophical concepts. But remember, this is Jesus who walked on the earth, and while he was walking on the earth, he said outrageous things like, I am the truth. You know, this is a a human being who's also God saying, I am truth. And so if you want to have a decent epistemology that— which is the discovery of truth, of getting access to truth— you need to know Jesus Christ. Otherwise, your epistemology is going to have holes and flaws in it. So I think, you know, because it is that fundamental, it's really easy for us to to want to make emotional appeals. It's really easy for us to want to do other things when we evangelize. And it really is an epistemological problem of what do you believe and what's your basis for belief. And when we think of faith and when we think about calling people to faith, we have to not just make it this superficial thing about, you know, I believe that Jesus Christ is my Savior. We actually need to believe that he is the purpose for the world. All things were made by him and through him and for him. And if we're not saying things like that during evangelism, it's really easy to win a false convert. A convert is who's saying, yes, I want Jesus Christ to be my Savior, but not a convert who says, yes, I recognize that my view of the world is completely wrong, and I need to have a different basis for how I look at the world. And that's really what evangelism should be, a different basis to look at the world is what it should result in. And you're quoting from John 1. I mean, elsewhere in John 1, it, that's, that's the world's fundamental problem is the world was dark. Mm-hmm. And that darkness, I mean— it's talking about moral darkness, but it's also talking about mental darkness. You just don't know your way around. And into that comes Jesus, and he's light. And that's what John's testifying to. Right. And John 1, you cannot separate the moral darkness from the intellectual darkness. Romans 1, you cannot separate the moral darkness from the intellectual darkness. And all other epistemological systems, they want to separate the moral darkness from the intellectual darkness, and it just, God says, that is not how it works. And so repentance has to be repenting from the moral darkness, and that also means that you start to see light intellectually. You start to have your mind renewed. You, God writes his law in your heart and your mind. I mean, these are the things that are fundamental to salvation, and it does come back to actually knowing the one who you say is your Savior. I mean, this is, this is why Christianity, why the gospel is, let me say it, this is why the gospel is good news. Because what we said from the beginning was a man is born into the world and God makes himself manifest to him. He sees that he's at enmity with God. And because man doesn't want to accept that world, he comforts himself with fake lies, with, with, the, with the, the philosophy of men, with his, own, with his own views of the world that comfort him. And so when you come to someone with the gospel, what you do is you have to both cut through all those that lies they've told themselves but you also bring them back to that point that they're at enmity with God and show them that they don't have to be at enmity with God. That's why it's good news. You, you don't just bring them back to this point where you go, you're at enmity with God and that's all there is, and you just have to face the fact that you're at enmity with God, that you bring them back to that point and bring them to Jesus Christ. And that, that is good news. And it changes, like you said, it changes the way a person thinks. But it's so easy, if you don't think of it that way, to turn the gospel into something that's pointless, to turn the gospel into something that's really powerless. But in the end, the gospel actually allows the person to live in the world that God has made and have God as their father, as opposed to have God as the one who is going to cast them into hell. You know, we've been talking about, you know, the theory of knowledge and how these things work out for Christians. And, you know, Proverbs 1.7 says, The fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge, but fools despise wisdom and instruction. And this is part of what happens at salvation, is that a fool starts to desire knowledge. 
and starts to not say the knowledge comes from myself, but comes from God. And that's, that's part of what the church needs to be doing. But I think in a lot of ways, the church has lost the fact that it is to be the pillared ground of the truth. And if we're not saying these things, if we're not saying knowledge matters, if we're not saying that where knowledge comes from matters, we should never expect the world to, because the world's always at war with knowledge. Thanks for joining us. This has been The Conquering Truth, a project of Reformation Baptist Church. If you found this helpful, you can visit us online at theconqueringtruth.com and subscribe here or in your favorite podcast app. Thanks for watching. Thank you.